I'm here to cover the uh, topic of CPAP. My name is Tony. I'm a paramedic instructor and a paramedic in the field here in Southern California. And i um, like to go over how it works and what it's used for. Uh, well, I guess I should start with what it's used for. In short, CPAP it stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And it is used for difficulty breathing. Now, difficulty breathing has many causes ranging from anxiety to embolisms uh, to uh, puncture in the lungs, pneumonia, bronchospasm, anaphylaxis, uh, you name it. The big reasons <clears throat> we see it most commonly in pre-hospital are uh, exacerbations of chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder or disease, which is uh, typically chronic bronchitis, emphysema, uh, we also see people with asthma, acute cases of asthma, and we also have pulmonary edema, secondary to left-sided heart failure. Just in case anyone tells you right-sided heart failure causes difficulty breathing, they're wrong. Now, right-sided heart failure may eventually lead to left-sided heart failure or vice versa. However, people don't call 911 for right-sided heart failure they almost never call a 911 for chronic pedal edema or even acute pedal edema. They call because they can't breathe. And if it turns out to be the left side of the heart is failing, then it is causing a fluid back up into the lungs, which again causes difficulty breathing and sometimes chest pain or chest pressure. <clears throat> Some other uses for CPAP are uh, at least one reported case of a uh, massive pulmonary embolism where a ER physician tried it, it worked, and apparently saved the patient's life. Other unlisted uh, uses for CPAP are chest trauma, chest wall trauma, uh, for example in a flail segment. Uh, CPAP could theoretically provide internal splinting uh, because it provides positive pressure which is not like the normal body's negative inspiratory pressure in breathing. So getting down to the reasons we would use it and how it works. We can start with <clears throat> pick one, uh, we'll say bronchospasm, wheezing for example that comes from asthma or even the wheezing that might occur when you have bronchitis, bronchopneumonia, or pneumonia. If the small airways of the lungs are affected, <clears throat> we'll say this is a mouth, here's the eyeballs, trachea, and the main bronchi, and then they split on down into smaller and smaller segments, all 22, 23 uh, segments down into the lungs. Well, <clears throat> when you take a breath in, we'll call this the thoracic cavity. And we'll call this the diaphragm, like a giant bell. The diaphragm drops down. Now, if you can imagine a syringe, with the plunger, the little rubber boot, and the syringe's body was here, and now you have the syringe. You pull that down, and it creates a negative pressure throughout the chest. You can also add chest expansion, which creates a negative pressure. That negative pressure basically sucks air down into the lungs. When you exhale, everything kind of springs back into place, the pressure increases slightly, and pushes the air back out. This is all fine and dandy. The problem is, is when you start having inflamed bronchioles, especially down at the smaller ones, where there's no cartilage to support them, as the person exhales, air is basically being pushed out. As it rushes out, these guys can kind of collapse right behind it. I'll give a, an example. When you exhale really hard, you can make yourself wheeze. You can cause your own 
bronchioles to collapse. Here. <sighs> Try it. Exhale as hard as you can, as forcefully as you can, and <sighs> hear the wheezing? The wheezing is a sound that air makes when these guys kind of collapse as I forcibly exhale. <clears throat> wheezing doesn't happen without airway narrowing. Think of another thing. If I uh, try to whistle with my mouth wide open, I can't do it. Narrow or purse my lips, now I can whistle. Same thing with the bronchioles. If they stay open, they don't make wheezing sounds. If they collapse, which means narrow, now they whistle. <clears throat> Let me show you how I can create my own CPAP and stop my whistling or my wheezing. I'm going to exhale as hard as I can. <gasps> now I'm going to purse my lips and try to whistle again, try to wheeze again. I was exhaling as hard as I can. Why do you think I wasn't wheezing? You guessed it. Because when I closed my lips here, or pursed my lips, as you might see in people with COPD, I created a back pressure as I exhaled. So I slowed the rush of air down. And by slowing that rush of air, these guys did not snap shut. They were held open or what I'd like to call, they were splinted. Pretty neat, huh? So we know that people with chronic emphysema, chronic bronchitis, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, when they're pretty seriously in trouble, and sometimes always, um, they have pursed lip breathing. It's not that they purse their lips when they're taking a breath in. That's pointless. That's not their issue. They purse their lips on exhalation. This is all to help maintain the airways open, especially because they don't have a lot of reserves. <clears throat> you may notice if you exercise really hard, you're exhausted, you may kind of like, <gasps> and that's also a way to kind of create a back pressure to expand uh, units of the lung that may have collapsed a little bit. CPAP, when we apply it to someone with COPD, creates a back pressure. So I said continuous positive airway pressure. When we apply CPAP, we have air being pushed in through the mask to the face. And a typical pressure is between 5 centimeters of water and 20 centimeters of water. It can go higher. That air is constantly coming in. It almost feels like having your head outside the window of a car or just standing and facing the wind. That air as it comes in, it may help you take a breath a little more easily. But the real magic in emphysema, bronchitis, and in asthma is during exhalation, it creates the effect of a pursed lip breathing. It creates a slight back pressure so that as the person exhales, these airways are splinted open. When these airways are splinted open, the air that's in the alveolar sections is allowed to fully get out. When it gets out, a couple things happen. Gas exchange is improved. The back pressure also helps the alveoli from collapsing, especially over a prolonged period of time, or in pneumonia, for example, where inflammation narrows these airways. These can start to collapse, they fill with some goop, and you have reduced surface area for gas exchange. You have a reduced ability to clear any pus or fluids through normal mechanisms like cough. And you reduce essentially the surface area in the lungs for breathing overall. That can lead in turn to hypoxemia, which then creates a vicious cycle that can get worse and worse. In asthma, uh, especially serious asthma, or we'll just say bronchospasm, regardless of what it's caused by, whether it's allergic, 
uh, bronchospasm or bronchospasm that comes from any uh, of the factors that lead to asthma, one of the issues is exhalation. So if a person has severe bronchospasm, they can take a breath in and they start to fill stuff up. Every time they exhale though, the airways narrow, shut down, and it kind of traps some air. Well, of course, they want to take another breath. Take another breath, and it fills up even more. And now the pressure is going up. And they try to exhale. They wheeze really hard on exhalation. They have air trapping. Give you an example of how that works. Breathe along with me. Take a breath, but don't exhale. Take another breath, don't exhale, keep going, in, no exhale, 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 and what have I done? I've created a big old barrel of air, a lot of it's stale not a good oxygen uh, ratio, and it's trapped. And what did that do to your breathing? How did it make your inspiration feel? Probably really hard. That would cause you to fatigue. Now you're breathing against more and more resistance because you're unable to completely exhale. This is a critical situation. If it goes long enough, you can actually develop a sign, a situation where your chest is so stuffed with air that it reduces blood return to the right side of the heart. Blood comes back to the right side of your heart from the inferior vena cava and also from the superior vena cava. Jugular veins drain into both, or I should say both jugular veins drain into your superior vena cava. <clears throat> Kuzmal's sign is when you take a breath and as you take a breath, because of the increased air pressure in the chest, in the lungs, you actually get JVD during the inspiration. Normally, when you take a breath in, as a normal breath in, because of that negative pressure, you actually help return blood flow to the heart. And if anything, you'll have a collapse of the jugular vein because the blood is just basically no pressure, drains right back down. So coming again to CPAP, via the continual positive airway pressure, CPAP helps splint these small airways. And provided the person with asthma has enough strength left to exhale against the resistance, they'll be able to push air out. Because just like a retreating a rear guard, that rear pressure keeps holding open these airways so this gas can escape and hopefully the balance in breathing is re-attained. Just some, another factor to consider is normal inspiration is active. We take a breath in, right? Muscle has to contract and depress in the diaphragm. And you may have accessory muscle use, an accessory expansion of the cage by using the muscles of the neck and the chest. Normal breathing, hard to see. If the diaphragm is dropping down, and nothing else is happening. Kind of hard to see, <clears throat> which may account for why respiratory rate is one of the biggest lies in medicine. It's almost always undercounted. We tend to cue in when we can see lots of movement. <sighs> now I can see me breathing and I can count it. I'm breathing quietly, it's really hard to do. I don't care if you play the trick where you're taking a pulse and watching or not. So, inspiration is active. Expiration, on the other hand, is passive ordinarily. Although if you're trying to move a lot of air, you can forcibly exhale. So where was I going with that? As I force the exhalation, I push the air out. My inspiration is roughly, we'll say, one or two seconds. Exhalation is 
ideally about twice that long. Inhalation, active muscle contraction, therefore quick. Exhalation, passive, everything's kind of collapsing on its own. If you're a disciple of breathing awareness and efficiency, you can actually breathe four, five, six times a minute and be perfectly fine. Think about the Navy SEALs, RAR. As a stress reduction technique, they teach the 4444 method of breathing, also called a square, and there's lots of names for it. Take a breath in. Let me try it again and get the count right. Inhale for four seconds. Hold for four seconds. Exhale for four seconds. Hold the exhale for four seconds. Inhale for four seconds. So I was inhaling four seconds and basically either exhaling or breath holding for a total of four times three, 12 seconds. It's a one to three ratio. In someone who is not breathing well, that ratio diminishes. Instead of inhaling for one, a count of one and exhaling for a count of two, they start to inhale for a count of one and exhale for a count of one and a half. Inhale for a count of one, exhale for a count of one. Really bad. Inhale for a count of one, exhale for a half second. And at the worst case, we get back to that inhaling, not exhaling. Air trapping. Now, no one does inhale and holds and then inhales more except as a demonstration. But say you were breathing over a period of minutes or hours <clears throat> and you took a breath for a second and you only exhaled or you exhaled for only, say, eight tenths of a second. Do that long enough and guess what we do? We get a positive stack and retain CO2, make it harder and harder to take a breath in, start to strain the cardiovascular system, and we're in a little hurt. So I've belabored that part. In one way or another, <clears throat> in pneumonia to a lesser extent, but asthma to a significant extent, and anything that causes bronchospasm or bronchial hypersensitivity, uh, where these guys collapse more easily for one reason or another, either due to lack of support because of the external framework, because they're narrower due to inflammation, or hypersensitivity, or fluid collapse happens. CPAP helps resolve that, or at least improve it, by helping the effort on inspiration, but just as important, providing resistance during exhalation so it creates that back pressure, which helps keep these guys open again. <sighs> Can't wheeze with that little back pressure. Continuing on to the next one. <clears throat> the big one. Congestive heart failure, in particular, left-sided heart failure. CHF is a general catch-all term for heart failure. It can be right-sided, left-sided, both. <clears throat> In my experience, most people have right-sided heart failure. That can be chronic. They can live on it for years. And uh, it's diagnosed indirectly with uh, signs like pedal edema, sometimes alterations in heart sounds, but more specifically with testing, like an ultrasound or echocardiogram. Left-sided heart failure doesn't last for long without you noticing it. As soon as the left side of the heart stops pumping effectively, you will get fluid buildup into the lungs, and you won't be able to breathe, and you will be miserable and either go to the hospital or call 911. So how does that happen? <clears throat> Let's draw an alveolus here. Just represent the alveolus. And the alveolus has a single 
cell wall thick. Of course, we have zillions of alve alveoli. And this is a thin layer of cells. The alveolus is splinted open by roughly 80% nitrogen. And because nitrogen doesn't dissolve across the alveolar membrane, it keeps it open. And it has, we'll just say that 20% is oxygen. This is like, most people get this. Now we have a capillary or the heart beating the right side of the heart, uh, pushing blood into the pulmonary arteries. They get all smaller and smaller and smaller until we get alveol or uh, capillaries, which essentially become almost one with the alveolar wall. Then the capillaries go back, form the pulmonary veins, and drop back down into, we'll call this, the left heart. The left heart pumps out into the aorta. I said the pulmonary artery, right? Well, that comes from <clears throat> the right heart. And I'm not separating ventricles and atria because it's at this point just considering a pump effect and pressure. What drains into the right heart? Well, we have the big vessels, if you will. The vena cava from the top and the vena cava from the bottom, VC. This, of course, splits into the subclavians and goes up into the jugulars. Here, we'll pretend that's the neck. And blood comes down largely by gravity. And from the lower part of your body, your leg muscles in particular, your calf muscles in particular, the deep calf muscles, the soleus muscles, are the big pump that pushes blood back up. That's why walking, or one of the reasons walking, moving around is so helpful. Blood's coming up this way. So far, so good. Now, just from our basic EMT, EMS knowledge, we know that when the heart beats, it, uh, and uh, during systole, the left side will put out a blood pressure of, we'll just say, 120 over 80, because that's what everyone is used to. And that's, of course, millimeters of mercury, and that's coming out of the aorta. And the left ventricle is pumping it. We'll call this the right ventricle. How does blood get to the heart? Well, it comes back into the venous circuit. And it pretty much comes in at a super, super low pressure, almost like slopping into the heart. Um, almost like as if you had a toilet that overflowed. It's just kind of like running over the top. Well, imagine the toilet here is kind of splashing into the uh, right atrium and the right ventricle. And that pressure, the blood returning here, is roughly, depending on which book you look at and which position you're in, We'll just say 2 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Barely even there. But it works. So where's the problem? We get the heart sloshing into the right ventricle, comes in the right atrium, drop down to the right ventricle, the pressure is boosted, it's pushed to the pulmonary system, which is a very low pressure system. So remember, this is a capillary. And capillaries also have walls that are only one cell thick or so. Now, the reason I'm here is because my artistic skills are, well, you can see them. As the blood is pushed into the capillaries in the pulmonary system, and as it spreads out more and more, it gets more and more diffuse. And the pressure is really, really low. It'd be almost like, I don't really have a good tool for this, but um, well, that didn't work. None of it worked. Oh, here we go.
This will also help explain why the right heart is thinner and weaker, which explains a whole lot of things relating to ECGs and so forth. If I was just going to blow out one small vessel, get a fair amount of resistance. Now, if this vessel actually is a whole bunch of them, like capillaries run into the lungs, and I try to blow out it, <laughs> holy crap, there's no resistance at all. It's almost like nil. And that's kind of how the circulation works for the right ventricle. It's pumping into the lungs through a big old large pipe, which splits more and more and more. And provided all the lung is open, that pressure is really low, so the right heart doesn't need a lot of pressure. So we'll just say that the blood going in the capillary that winds up being right next to the alveolus is at a pressure of 12 over 8. 120 over 80, 12 over 8. <clears throat> to my knowledge, they haven't made a blood pressure cuff small enough to fit in there, and it's calculated indirectly by measuring pressures in the right ventricle. And actually, they can actually go in there and essentially kind of get a look and estimate this pressure. At 12 over 8, with the cells being one, or the capillaries being one cell wall thick, that allows, my red pen died, so that's why I'm not using it. Red blood cells are squeezing on through here, <clears throat> and then you have the diffusion of gas. So oxygen, seeing that this blood has less oxygen in it, and being crowded in the alveoli, hey, let me jump on this ride here. Goes into the capillaries, into the blood attached to the hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide coming from the body finds there's very little carbon dioxide in the alveoli and quite a bit of carbon dioxide in the capillary blood. It jumps over. I mean, no one wants to be crowded. So they're actually taking their own form of, oh God, Bear with me here, social distancing. That's perfect. Then the 12 to 8 comes in the right ventricle, or left ventricle, concentrated, and with the combination of the massive muscle of the left ventricle and the back pressure, remember that small thing, caused by systemic vascular resistance, punches out and gets your systolic pressure of 80, diastolic pressure, I'm sorry, systolic pressure of 120, diastolic pressure of 80. All is good. So now, let's take this one step more. Let's pretend we have five liters of blood coming into the right heart, pumped into the capillaries, exchanging gas, and coming out to the left ventricle, and the left ventricle pumps out five liters per minute. Everything's hunky-dory. These numbers are, of course, approximate. They change with size and other things, but you get the idea. Well, this is a problem. <clears throat> if the left ventricle, for some reason, fails, it develops a heart attack, ischemia, weakness, whatever reason, it gets weak. Acutely weak, as in an MI, or just progressively weaker, weaker, weaker until it finally becomes noticeable. Now say it can only punch out three liters of blood a minute. What happens to the other two? Well, while three go out this way, the other two start to back up into the system. As that back pressure increases, oh my God, I just had another connection. This is like the CPAP for the heart, <laughs> backing up pressure, splinting it open. Well, this pressure might go up now from 12 over 8 to, let's say, 20 over 100, or 20 over 10, sorry. Again, millimeters of mercury. These capillary walls are only rated for maybe 12 over 8. And now they're being stretched apart, and plasma from this hyperinflated, for Steve Casares' students, increased hydrostatic pressure, now finds itself diffusing into the alveoli. 
And in this case, a single alveolus, let me push that, push that nitrogen out of the way, starts to fill up with fluid. As the fluid builds up, one alveolus at a time, you start losing the ability to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide very well. As more and more alveoli become full, this fluid affects the ability to the alveolus to stay open because surfactant is maybe washed away. So on exhalation, you will hear the alveoli and this itty bitty little airways leading from it, opening and closing with snapping and popping sounds. Imagine this was like wet, and when you exhale it closes, and then you inhale, it pops, creating that grindy hair sound that we call crackles, or fine crackles, or old school call rawls. <clears throat> Big problems. So, what do we do about it? Well, we can't fix the MI in the field. However, we can reduce the workload to the left ventricle. This is where a couple of meds come in for pre-hospital. Now the old school way was to give Lasix, which is pretty much stupid because a great many people with congestive heart failure are already dehydrated. In fact, for that matter, most of us are. And that only works kind of on this side of the circuit. It doesn't really help a whole lot. What else can we do? We can give nitro. And in pre-hospital, we give nitro transmucosally. I know you're going to say sublingual. Well, that's sort of true. But that's like sort of like saying, I'm going to give you IV fluids via AC or via EJ or via whatever you call a vein in the back of your wrist. No, I'm giving it to you intravenously. Wherever I poke the hole doesn't matter, so go into a vein. I'm going to give nitro transmucosally, which means I'm going to put it somewhere in your mouth hole. It'll dissolve through the mucous membranes, straight into the capillary system, and with any luck, will go and cause increased vasodilation in the venous circuit. The venous circuit. Ventricular return, or correction, blood return to the right ventricle. <clears throat> Why does that work? I'm glad you asked. If I can take the veins throughout the body and dilate them slightly, relax them slightly, just like with the NPAs here, if I breathe through, <clears throat> if I have to push blood through a narrow deal, it's more pressure. If I breathe through a larger one, a lot less pressure. If I dilate these, I reduce the pressure of blood, and then, of course, that correlates to volume. In the end, I reduce the return of blood to the right ventricle. Let's work with me here. Say to 2.5 liters. By return, reducing my blood flow to the right ventricle, to right heart, to 2 to 5 liters, to 2.5 liters, and my left side of the heart is still managing to push out three liters a minute? Well, guess what happens here? This pressure now drops down, we'll just say to, oh, 11 over seven. <clears throat> that allows blood flow to start speeding up this way. And guess what? Just like a stopped toilet, this blood starts to come out of the alveoli and resolve the pulmonary edema. Think of unplugging a jammed toilet or sink when you're talking about clearing pulmonary edema. Misconception number one, and probably two and three because it's such a misconception, is that by applying CPAP, you push like as if pushing air down here will somehow push the fluid out of the alveoli. Well, again, think of that toilet thing. Imagine you were just pushing air on the water and hoping that'll somehow unclog the toilet. Hypothetically, it's possible if you had a massive mega plunger, 
and you put on the toilet seat and sealed off the leaks around the rim, you might do that. <clears throat> pretty hard, pretty inefficient. Another thing, your body doesn't give any clue that it's doing that. Remember with COPD, how you start purse-lip breathing? That's a mechanism the body adapts to help splint open the airways. Purse-lip breathing works by increasing the pressure against which you exhale, so that creates a back pressure, splinting the airways. If back pressure what was needed to push blood out of there, or fluid, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I imagine we would do it, but that's not enough, at least nothing I've ever seen. So how else can we reduce venous return to the heart, because nitro sometimes doesn't work, maybe tricky, the person just took Viagra, can't give nitro, they have a combination of right-sided failure as well as left-sided failure, oh crap. What else can we do? We apply CPAP. Magic. You can do it with BiPAP as well, but CPAP is what we carry because it's mechanically way easier. So we put a CPAP circuit, so now the person's breathing against resistance, but they're also getting air with assistance. So inspiration wise, it helps with the distress. It brings in a little extra oxygen. It starts to boost the pressure throughout the intrathoracic cavity. And during exhalation, just in case you're starting to get wheezing, this is a hot topic here, but if you get pulmonary edema because of left-sided failure, you can develop what is, I don't know if it's official or not, but it's called cardiac asthma. And no one knows exactly what causes that. However, there is a notion that if you get fluid in the lungs, there is going to be some sort of reflexive, protective bronchial, bronchial narrowing. Uh, it may be sort of like the body's way of slamming the barn door shut after the horse is gone. Whatever it is, it can cause wheezing, and that only makes things worse. So the CPAP may help the wheezing, although bronchodilators can do that as well. But the big magic is that the CPAP will now increase that intrathoracic pressure because you've gone from negative pressure breathing, which is negative pressure to suck air in, and exhalation, to now it's adding five centimeters, seven centimeters, 10 centimeters of additional pressure to your inspiration. And keep in mind, normal breathing is only a difference about three or four centimeters a gradient between the uh, lungs and the external air. Like if you just take a negative pressure breath of negative five, you get a breath in. CPAP is adding to that. <clears throat> As it increases this pressure, guess what it does to the vena cava? it basically, as it passes through the diaphragm and from an area of lower pressure in your gut to now an area of higher pressure in your thoracic cavity, the diaphragm's the wall, sort of like an IUD diaphragm, right? This reduces also. So CPAP has the effect, just like transmucosal or transdermal nitroglycerin, of reducing preload. By reducing preload, we again give the left side of the heart a break not fixing anything, but we're keeping the person from dying. We let the left heart pump as if it was in a boat with a leaking hole. It's now pumped is strong enough to get rid of that water. For you fire snobs out there, you could call it educting. Net result, we clear the pulmonary edema. The alveoli essentially lose that extra water, blister fluid if you want to think of it that way are able to expand better, you don't get closure of the small airways, crackles disappear. Now, of course, you just got to find out why <clears throat> they had a left ventricular failure in the first place, and that's where your 12 lead comes in. Do a 12 lead, and if it's a STEMI, run them to a uh, cardiac cath center to where they can fix whatever's causing the heart to fail. If it's an end STEMI, same thing, a little longer process. So far, I hope this is clear and helpful. If it's at a hospital, they can give, or a CCT uh, uh, system with critical care, they can give IV nitro, and IV nitro will reduce systemic vascular resistance as well. So it's like a double whammy. 
you have reduction of blood flow here, and you have reduction of resistance to the left heart, which makes it even easier. Like taking a fat guy who's struggling to do push-ups and kind of picking up by the straps, helping him go up each time. <clears throat> okay, for the aspiring medic students out there, just cover a couple little things here. And we're not covering all of them. Remember, this is just done without a script. The other causes that you might lead to weakened and eventually perhaps damage to the left ventricle, whether it's a chordae tendinae, whatever it is, you can have aortic stenosis, which is against bad luck, created a stenotic or narrowed opening. And if you've had that for most of your life, or maybe develop it for whatever reason, the left ventricle is now having to pump through that really narrow pipe, and it causes it to expand, to increase in size, and eventually compromises on circulation. And that can lead to left-sided heart failure. Um, you also heard mitral valve, or valve failure, rather. So if there's a leak, when it beats, blood's supposed to go out here and then these doors slam shut, but if there's a leak, you get some backflow of blood and can start leading to, I believe it's called end diastolic failure. But that's all beside the point, because we can't fix that. One small side tip. <clears throat> if you paid zero cents for this video, you're gonna get this for zero cents. We all know that when the left ventricle pumps out into the systemic circulation via the aorta. Blam! Squeezes that systolic pressure. That gets blood out to the heart, particular to the brain, sorry. Gets to the brain, kidneys, rest of the body. So when does the heart get blood? I can see you during diastole. So when the heart beat, these valves open, blood splashed out there, and you get a systolic beat. The valve closes like a back door, like it's you get kicked out of the club, left the club, and the bouncer slams the door and doesn't let you back in. It tries to come back. That little back wave is what now goes through the coronary arteries. And blood perfuses the heart during diastole. <clears throat> Sounds almost like trivia. Well, it isn't. The relevance of that is many of the medications we do are to lower blood pressure, to reduce the work of the left heart against the resistance of the body. <clears throat> Systole is when the body gets its blood flow. Diastole is when the heart gets its blood flow. As the heart swells, as it enlarges, more and more resistance is present in the coronary arteries, not even counting if one of them is clogged up. If you lower diastolic pressure too much, we'll say below 70, the weakness of the blood flow coming in is maybe significant and cause a person, now the heart is basically not getting any blood or getting even less blood. Crash the patient. <clears throat> Another hot tip is if you've ever seen pulmonary edema from congestive heart failure from an MI, very characteristically, the blood pressure you get on that patient will be super high. We'll just call it 190 over 120. Diastolic blood pressure spikes. You can have 190 over 80. Okay, that's not good, but probably not gonna be dropping dead. But next time you get a person with pulmonary edema, and it's from left-sided failure, you see the high diastolic pressure, it's almost a dead giveaway. That and the sympathetic response, which, oh, by the way, goes with SVR, cool pale skins, diaphoresis. It is possible that this spike in diastolic blood pressure is a method to try to force more blood into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is like this big, fat balloon and all the hoses that were sitting on the outside of it, the coronary arteries, are now like squished by the enlargement and the backflow of blood there. It's just a nightmare. Diastolic pressure increases to try to push blood 
back into the left ventricle, back into the heart. It's kind of like a spiraling death loop though. If you want to think of an analogy, think of Cushing's response in the brain. You have some sort of increase in resistance to blood flow coming up in your brain. What does the body do? Boost the pressure to try to increase the pressure of blood going in to overcome the resistance in the head. It works, but at the same time it's making itself worse. So bottom line, sucky situation. I don't know when I got off on that track there. So now I'm going to give a situation where CPAP doesn't work. And this is really important because this happens. And as I get past that, then you'll kind of understand our indications, contraindications. So we have our heart beating. We have our 12 over 8, our 120 over 80. And our heart's beating with a normal physiologic range of between 60 and 100. <clears throat> and for whatever reason, the heart develops a problem. Oh, and we don't have fluid in there. The heart, uh, we'll just call it AFib. Could be a flutter. Could be anything that causes a super fast heart rate. Say so now, get on this patient, find them that they are having trouble breathing. Um, check their blood pressure and it's like, normal, maybe slightly high. But you, because you're a really high speed medic, and before they could get the electrodes on, plant your stethoscope to the chest and you hear, it's fast. Get the EKG on, and you see some sort of garbage where it's going really fast, and you listen to the chest and you hear, crackles. I didn't say this before, but when you get edema, it's crackles in the bases because gravity is this way, so fluid sloshes down here. Of course, if you let it go long enough, it'll fill up, but it starts at the bottom. If it's lying on the back, it'll just be this way. If it's lying on the right side, you'll just sit on that side. Well, this is the situation where the heart is beating so fast that it is not really getting the blood going anywhere which is why the blood pressure drops. You have sloppy ejection. But the net result is the same. Blood's returned to the right ventricle, five liters. Coming out of the left ventricle at two liters. Backs up. This goes up to 20 over eight. You gotta get fluid back in the alveolus. And when you have a buttload of them, they're alveoli. Edema, trouble breathing, become hypoxemic, possibly retaining CO2, get more stress, then it becomes a vicious cycle and you die. Two ways to deal with this. If they're really far gone, well, let me back up. This is a rate dependent issue. So if you apply CPAP here, it's gonna be trying to block something, but it's really not the case. Instead, we have a situation where we just need to get heart beating at a more appropriate, careful, productive rate. So I don't know how many of you guys are swimmers out there, but imagine you're at the side of a pool, or you're just paddling water with your hands, or your flippers. And you go at a certain rate and you're pushing water nice and easily, okay? But you ever sat there and just start do that. You're flapping your hands or flippers, your feet, and now instead of moving forward, you're just making bubbles. Water's not really moving. You're cavitating, submarina or ship terms. So blood flow isn't happening. That's kind of what happens when you have a super fast heart rate. Things are moving down and out so fast, filling isn't adequate, emptying isn't adequate. <coughs> So we get that 160, 170, 180, whatever heart rate it is, fix it. Fix the rate, there goes the pulmonary edema. Now once upon a time in our county in California, we had calcium channel blockers which were gold. They worked for that. Fantabulous. Every bet, won it. 
Do the calcium channel blocker, cause the heart to stop beating so fast. Pulmonary edema resolved. So much for that stupid thing about pulmonary edema and being a contraindication for calcium channel blockers. Well, no one bothered to think that out. If it's the rate causing the pulmonary edema, fix the rate. There goes the pulmonary edema. Yay, calcium channel blockers. But dumbasses all over say uh, Verapakil. That's only because they don't know what they're talking about. Cardizem does the same thing. <clears throat> we don't have that anymore. We do have amiodarone, which can be given as a drip. It's not a protocol, but you can ask for it. You can beg. You could try giving magnesium. Slide, you push, drip, I am. That, in my experience, has converted on controlled AFib. Worked like a champ. But good luck getting an order for that. By the way, magnesium kind of works as a physiologic calcium channel blocker and muscle relaxant. <clears throat> you could try, although I doubt it would work with AFib, bageling the patient. That whole <laughs> hardly ever works. But if you have them stick their face in a pot of cold water, especially for a narrow complex regular rhythm, uh, works like a charm. Only had to fail once. Has to be ice in the water. Has to make them like take a breath in, but they can't because their face is underwater. If the person's in bad, bad shape, start bobbing, start changing LSC. That's when you have to light them up. That's where cardioversion is going to come into play. Again, we were hamstrung in this county because uh, too few people actually understand rate dependent CHF, wrap mill, or anything. So they were just lame. That's water under the bridge now and water in the lungs. So you can cardiovert them. If you just don't want CH, uh, CPAP though, uh, probably not going to work because preload isn't the issue here. And we can't really fix afterload. So CPAP works for asthma and anything where exhalation leads to shutdown or closure of the bronchi, where impaired movement of gases or air causes collapse and progressive collapse of the alveoli. And it's magic for uh, left-sided failure leading to pulmonary edema, provided the rate isn't the cause of failure. I did say really, really fast heart rate. Well, it goes for also super slow. If you happen to have a slow heart rate, 30s, 40s, something that's way slower than you would expect for that patient, I've never seen it personally, but theoretically it's possible. In that case, atropine or pacin if you want to. So, coming down. When you have a person with trouble breathing, because that's why they call, or that's why you are called. Trouble breathing, the indications are pulmonary edema from left-sided failure, ideally, uh, and not rate-dependent. <clears throat> Pneumonia, COPD, bronchitis, emphysema, bronchial pneumonia, asthma, and those are, at least in our county, the approved reasons for applying CPAP. However, we do give it for trouble breathing, and sometimes we don't exactly know what the trouble breathing is caused by. So hypothetically, it could be a pulmonary embolism, because you don't know, especially if it's been there for a while and you have some atelectasis building up. And hypothetically, it could be used for flail chest segments, although well, you probably still need a buttload of pain control. And um, as the one, let's see, was there any other ones? Yeah, that's all I can think of right now. <clears throat> what are the signs? Obviously, patient's distress level. Next thing, respiratory rate. Always check the respiratory rate. Respiratory rate is the biggest lied about vital sign in EMS. So this is where you want to put them on capnography right off the bat, because CO2 measuring... Uh, that waveform works really well, as long as you're not talking or coughing too much. Otherwise, pay good attention to the respiratory rate if you need to with a stethoscope. Look at their depth. If they're shallow on respirations, it could be a couple of things. Uh, three things, actually, that I can think of. One, they're panicking and they're just breathing fast. Two is because they can't get air in. Three is because they can't get air out. And we'll throw four a combination of those. Then we have the effort. If you see increased effort breathing,
I left my little res wind resistance breather. Let's see if I can do it with this here. That doesn't work, blame, blame the lighting. Inspiratory wheezing, trouble getting a breath in, you'll see tracheal tugging. If you see a skinny person, you'll see uh, intercostal tugging. Sorry, I ain't gonna see it on me. And on really small people, infants, or unstable chests, you can see seesaw breathing in the chest. Next thing, of course, you wanna listen to the pattern. And this takes a lot of practice, so I'm going to put pattern on the back burner for the moment. You look at effort, and if you see increased effort, then there's a good chance there's airway narrowing. So we have to keep that in mind. Listen, do you hear wheezing? If you hear clear wheezing, diffuse wheezing throughout, that's kind of a good sign, but it says there is some bronchospasm going on. If you don't hear any wheezing, but you hear movement of air all over the place, it's a good sign too. If you hear no air moving or very little air, and you can barely hear any wheezing, especially in the top, and nothing in the bottom, well, chances are the patient's going to look like crap when you see him. So that's bad news. If you have bronchial spasm, closure of the airways, note to self, you've got to open those airways, and CPAP may not be enough. Then we look at <clears throat> the pattern. Are they retaining? <gasps> so they're breathing in, but they're not really breathing out. Or are they doing this over here? <gasps> well, now we know they're not retaining, but they're working to push air out. <clears throat> Note to self, one to two, one to three, inspiratory versus expiratory ratio. Skin signs, big fat help. In left-sided heart failure, in 30 years, I've seen a lot of them. Almost without fail, they have sympathetic hyperactivation the fight or flight part of the nervous system. Peripheral shutdown, increased SVR, leads to pallor, uh, clammy skins, and clammy skins leads to cold skins. Now remember that it just come out of a jacuzzi or sauna, we're talking clammy, uh, and it's inappropriate. Other times that could happen is in sepsis, in pneumonia, uh, that's my experience, that's typically it. Anytime you have a, a, a boost in blood pressure or a ton of shunting peripherally, the sympathetic system kicks into play. On the other hand, COPD years, emphysema, bronchitis, pneumonia, um, generally speaking, unless they're in shock, you don't see them shut down peripherally as much and their skins tend to be dry and they may be off color, although it's kind of sometimes hard to tell. But cool, pale, diaphoretic, moist, clammy, or profuse skins, that's a big fat, uh oh, watch out for that. And next thing is I wanna see what their BP is. If their BP is super high like that, 180 over 100, uh, 200 over 120, that's slam dunk. I'll listen to the chest and I'll hear crackles. If I don't hear crackles because of the diminished, I'll open up a bronchodilator, now I can hear crackles. That's just kind of confirming things. SPO2, duh, try to get a baseline, make sure you get good capture. And tidal CO2, try to get it, but don't count on it. In COPD ears with a normal uh, SPO2, but who are retaining, you may have a pulse ox of 100, but their CO2 is through the roof. That's a respiratory pattern issue they're retaining. Try to coach them, and before they get tired, try them on CPAP. On the CPAP, it's important. Don't tell them just breathe normally. That's kind of pointless because normal is not really ideal in most people's breathing. You want to think of Lamaze breathing. Pretend that patient is your wife and she's having a baby. Breathe, honey. <sighs> Although I don't really know what Lamaze breathing looks like, I'm emphasizing the <sighs> blow air out. Blow air out. And with the CPAP splinting the small airways, that should help. A little bronchodilation, that should help. If you're really cool, you'll flip your monitor and show them their CO2 waveform. Tell them, breathe that down. Make that number lower. And oh, by the way, that wave, make it long, as long as you can. It's a cool trick, biofeedback works. Pulse rate, blood pressure, SpO2, CO2. Obviously with a decreased SpO2, give them increased oxygen. If it's bronchospasm, 
bronchodilate. Now there's again a kind of reflexive spastic attitude out there that albuterol bronchodilators are wrong for pulmonary edema. Well that's a bunch of crap, sort of. Um, the truthful part of it is back when we didn't have CPAP and back when we didn't have capnography, uh, one of a medic's worst fears was a trouble breathing. A patient with difficulty breathing because so many things can cause it. And you get someone who's shut down, they got COPD, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, everything at once. You don't know what the hell's going on. So you wind up doing all we could do back in the day, which was give them albuterol. <clears throat> Who was thinking left-sided heart failure and pulmonary edema? Half, we didn't really know what the heck it was half the time. So you give them albuterol, and albuterol is beta-2 selective. And beta-2 selective means it is aimed for the beta-2 receptors in the pulmonary tree. If it was beta-1 selective, it would go to the beta-1 receptors in the heart through the system, which is still going to be pretty weak. <clears throat> That's why albuterol was invented. Short-acting, fast-acting and short-acting. Sort of like a cheap gigolo. If you give enough albuterol, say you have that pulmonary edema patient and you start giving albuterol. It doesn't work, of course, because it's pulmonary edema left-sided failure. You give them another albuterol. It doesn't work. Well, eventually you're going to saturate the beta-2 receptors in the lungs. And when it comes to selectivity, whether beta-1, beta-2, beta-3, alpha-1, whatever, <clears throat> the albuterol molecules are not going to find any more open beta-2 receptors, so they stop getting less picky. Like someone's at a nightclub and it's getting close to end of, uh, close to uh, closing, stop caring who you pick up for a date. You just pick up anything. Well, albuterol will do the same thing. Now it can become beta-1 triggering, but it's really hard to say, does the albuterol cause that or the fact the person's dying causes that? Because as they're going downhill, guess what? Sympathetic spaz attack happens. It's causing everything to collapse all at once. Bad news. Problem is you can't dissect someone afterwards and say they died from sympathetic overload because of a beta-2 agonist or not. It's kind of hard to be sure. <clears throat> So, coming back, you have no movement of air, and you have pulmonary edema, you can't hear because they have bad movement of air, or they're wheezing and they have accessory muscle use and labored breathing, it sucks no matter what. Get rid of the obstruction in the bronchial tree. Give an albuterol. <clears throat> Throw an atrovent in there while you're at it. And listen, now the lung sound should open up, and you will be much more able to hear pulmonary edema crackles in the bases. This is the magic. Jump on the CPAP nitro angle. Run your 12 lead for AMI. One of the ways we could figure this out before we had capnography <clears throat> and before we were even thinking about STEMIs was you find a typical pulmonary edema patient and they were shut down and their heart rate's beating at like 150. And 150 is kind of that magic number where compensatory heart rate seems to peak, most people, 150 to 160. And I'm talking adults. I can't breathe, start developing pulmonary edema, my heart rate starts to go up and up and up and up as it's trying to compensate, I'm panicking, hypoxemic, the works, <clears throat> my heart rate hit 150, 160. My medic twin comes in and says, hey, what's up? <gasps> I can't breathe. So they give me Albuterol, because it's the fastest thing I can get on board, and I still haven't quite got a blood pressure going. My medic twin is watching me and looking as I'm doing the pipe. <sighs> Are you feeling better? I don't think so. What is my medic twin watching? The pulse rate. If I'm reducing his work of breathing and I'm making him feel better, guess what will happen? Pulse rate will drop. Sometimes like 10, 15, 20, right off the bat. And I'm thinking, medic twin me is thinking, yay. I'll also watch the respiratory rate. Now I have to admit, medic me of yesteryear wasn't really counting respiratory rate that much. I was kind of dumb then. Now I'm watching respiratory rate. Is that decreasing? And of course I'm listening to lung sounds, watching the SAT, other stuff like that. If everything's getting better with an albuterol, the patient's like, oh my God, I feel so much better. Yay. Good. Go with it. If you give that albuterol and you start saying albuterol atrovent cocktail and they're still at 150 and they're not budging, 
or maybe even getting a little worse. Blood pressure comes back. Oh, crap. 190 over 100. Now with the pulmonary edema CHF thing. So far, so good. Good. Keynote, I mentioned that the diastolic typically will just say, once the diastolic creeps up greater than 90 and typically into the low hundreds, uh, it's a pretty big fat hint for pulmonary edema. However, once I ran on this lady, she was a little thing, and she had a BP of 130 over 90. And she had crackles. Actually, she had no crackles because it was still interstitial. By interstitial, I mean the tissues right in between the lungs and the capillaries, the alveoli and the capillaries were starting to swell up. It wasn't quite ripping through, but it was enough to cause difficulty with oxygenation. And we ran out on her. Actually, another department ran out on her. Gave her an albuterol. She was really cool. She's a real trooper. She goes, oh, no, I'm okay. Sent them packing. We were canceled, which was... Woohoo, back to bed. 30 minutes later, get called back out. And this time, my unit got there first. <clears throat> I canceled fire. The lady was sitting there looking at me. She looked to be in moderate distress. She was a little bit tachypnic. She wasn't significantly labored. And I couldn't really hear anything in her lungs either. Barely anything. Like, Damn, the hell. Put her on pulse ox and it was like 95. Her BP, uh, 130 over 90. Pulse rate, we'll just say 100 because I can't remember, so I'm making it up. I was stumped. If you had seen my monkey self, I was like, kind of do this number here. So then I have the brilliant idea. Ma'am, what does your blood pressure normally run? Is it normally low, average, or is it high? And she goes, oh, my blood pressure, it's normally 90 over 60. Holy shit, Nola. 90 over 60, 130 over 90. That's like a big, big fat difference. She was hypertensive for her, significantly, 30% higher. That'd be like a 120 over 80 going up to... I don't know, 170 over 110, you can do the arithmetic. So I did the only other dirty trick I have to tell if it's pulmonary edema. I can't even say it works all the time because I haven't done a controlled, double-blinded study on every pulmonary edema patient in the world. But we did the old school trick, which is, ma'am, I'd like you to try something. Have the pulse ox on you. Do you mind lying down a moment? Laid her down. She laid down and pulse ox dropped instantly by like 3 or 4%. Okay, come back up. Gave her nitro, and then back then we gave her morphine and some Lasix. And by the time we got to the emergency department, she was smoking and joking, having a good old time. All symptoms resolved. She did have an, she did have an underlying MI, but we only had three lead monitoring back then, so I never knew. So note to yourself, all vital signs should be referenced to the patient's normal vital signs. Whatever is typical for that patient. So 130 over 90 would be a blood pressure that was good for me most days. For her, that was profoundly hypertensive. So pay attention to that. Again, no script, talking out my butt here, so go to little deviations left and right. So we have our indicators. Difficulty breathing, <clears throat> most effective for left-sided heart failure, pulmonary edema. I don't say CHF because CHF is nonspecific. Bronchospasm, especially on exhalation. Coming down, contraindications. Well, age in our county is a contraindication. If it's, they're below 14, they say no. There's no reason for it. But then again, you hardly ever see someone who needs it that's not responsive to bronchodilators. Altered, uncooperative, unresponsive. Well, that's kind of a dud thing because you need the person to kind of cooperate to put the mask on. Uncooperative, if you can't calm them down, it's probably not going to be a go either. Apnea, CPAP only works if you're breathing. If they're agonal breathing, well, again, CPAP's not going to really work. And ineffective breathing, someone who's panting or really shallow, if you can't kind of coach them down, may not work. The other thing everyone talks about is 
blood or nausea and vomiting. Well, in a nutshell, anything that's going to make the choke pay attention. So if the person's bleeding heavily enough that putting a mask on them is going to cause an airway issue, then you can't put it on. Try to stop the bleeding if you can, or somehow deal with it. Hell, place an NPA and put a, uh, uh, put a suction cath in the NPA and turn it on. That may help. Puke, same thing. If they're nauseated, give them some Zofran. But the big thing is, if they do have a risk of puking or they're bleeding, you could try the CPAP. I mean, I'm trying to picture a situation where you have like a massively jacked up face and pulmonary edema or bronchospasm. But you could try putting on the CPAP and then open it, drain, put it on, open it, drain. Your capno will be useless at that point, but just thoughts. Uh, pneumothorax. Now, simple pneumothorax should not, but may be worsened by... CPAP. Tension pneumothorax will definitely be worsened by it. And if you have an open chest wound and when they take a breath in, air bubbles in, that's bad. The exhale, let's see which way it goes here. If I take a breath in and air bubbles in, that's right, it's getting sucked in and then it doesn't come out. If it bubbles when I take a breath in, that's not bad. But rule of thumb, if they have a pneumothorax, you suspect a pneumo, don't do the CPAP on them. And uh, if they have facial or head trauma, well, that's not really clarified. If their face is too messed up or their head's too messed up to put the mask and straps on, that'll kind of nix it. And then the blood pressure. Magic. One more cool magic thing. Lower than 90 is considered the magic number for the generic adult. If I was on, oh, I erased it. That one older lady whose normal BP is 90 over 60, I'd give it and I'd tell them, hey, that's a normal BP. Best thing is about CPAP, if you... If you put it on and it doesn't work, take it off. If you put it on and it's helping a little bit, increase it. It's not like a drug where it's fire and you know a lawyer is attached to it. Like you get nitro and you're screwed up or something like that. CPAP is nice, you put it on, if they get worse and you can't fix it, then take it off. You're no worse than you were when you first got on scene. So one more little bit. Contraindications for uh, uh, CPAP kind of tie in with thoracic trauma, tension, pneumothorax, right-sided heart failure. So, ready? If you have right-sided heart failure and the person is in shock because of that, or will not even go to shock, we'll just say right-sided heart failure. Uh, isn't nitroglycerin contraindicated in pre-hospital world? Generally, yes. Why? Because remember how nitroglycerin reduces preload? Well, if the right heart is already lame and you reduce preload, you just shut down the whole thing. Like having an engine and you kill the prime. Okay? If you have a tension pneumothorax, as that intrathoracic pressure builds, is massive pressure gradient, guess what you die of? Right heart failure, obstructive shock. If you have a tension pneumothorax and you, I'm sorry, not you, but your patient has tension pneumothorax and one of you is moronic enough to start bagging them, guess what you'll do? PPV will make the tension pneumo worse. If you apply CPAP to them, same principle. Now that reduction in preload to the heart, which was therapeutic for the pulmonary edema patient, is excessive, and you kill the patient. I forget the name of the dude who said it, but everything is toxic in the right dose. Or if you take enough of anything, it'll be poisonous. Well, think of that. Too much intrathoracic pressure kills someone. Too little, maybe hurts them. But in certain conditions, like, again, left-sided failure, where you want to reduce preload, a little uh, increase in thoracic pressure could be helpful. So I think for one, without a script, covered most of the stuff. It is 0159 California Standard Time on the day after Labor Day. So hope this helped. Don't send any bad messages. And uh, good night.